So ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the second part of deformation processes, deformation processes in the plastic field. And here we are looking at grain boundary diffusion creep. Uh, that is also called cobble creep. It's exactly the same thing, but I prefer the term grain boundary diffusion creep because it is a descriptive term that uh, helps you to, to memorize what it is actually about and uh, also then to better understand the process. We see here very sketchy examples of uh, the process as such and you see here uh, two grains meeting each other at a high stress point and uh, let's assume the largest stress is acting vertically. Ions that are exposed to the stress concentration at the interface of these two grains uh, will tend to redistribute and diffusion if temperature is high enough for diffusion supported processes uh, will uh, or may occur along the grain boundaries, grain boundary diffusion creep. And uh, if ions, cations, anions are redistributed along the grain boundary, we might change the shape of these two grains, removing material here from the interface and uh, adding it onto uh, areas of the grain that are not exposed to high stress. What looks here like a growth seam is uh, in fact not something that we would see in thin section. Uh, this is rather highlighting the redistributed material, but it would be redistributed in such a way that ions are uh, adding to the grain in exactly the same lattice and structural direction of the grain, so that you cannot see that material actually has been redistributed from high stress to low stress sites. So don't expect to see in thin section uh, differently colored growth seams or texturally different growth seams. Uh, you might see that with other analytical techniques, but uh, uh, the, the grain boundary diffusion creep, the cobble creep, is not that easy to spot. What is important is that for this kind of diffusion, of diffusion along grain boundaries of pre-existing grains, we do not need any fluid phase. This can happen in the dry field and uh, ions might may move from one side to the other without being dissolved in a fluid phase. We come back to this point a little bit later. The redistribution of atoms of cations and anions uh, in one certain direction might go together with vacancies moving into the opposite direction because if you remove material from the crystal structure on such a high stress site, it will be replaced by a void, by an unoccupied structural site, and uh, that per definition is a vacancy. Typically, grain boundary diffusion creep is active at low differential stresses, but at relatively high temperature because we need diffusion. We need to have temperature high enough that atom bondings actually break and individual ions can move by reattaching and detaching themselves from the grain surface uh, again and again until they eventually come to rest in a low stress site. We see here the uh, strain ellipsis, we see here our marker circle for the initial undeformed state and we see here the strain ellipse with the longest and the shortest axis uh, indicating the strained, the deformed state and uh, what we can see is that this is a volume constant, an isochoric process. We see here no volume change happens during the redistribution of material. Let's now discuss volume diffusion, or also called Nabarro herring creep. This is a process that is similar to grain boundary diffusion creep, only that the uh, atoms or the vacancies move not along the grain boundary, but through the volume internally through the crystal structure. Uh, volume diffusion about a herring creep therefore requires certain minimum temperatures that are specific for each mineral species, minimum temperatures that allow atom diffusion. Vacancies would always go from low stress to high stress sites, whereas the atoms would move in the opposite direction and this eventually will change the shape of the crystal and uh, this is illustrated here by the strain ellipse comparing it to the unstrained uh, state. Again, this is an isochoric process, a so-called isochoric deformation process 
in which no volume change takes place. Volume diffusion is usually a little bit slower than grain boundary diffusion creep, also grain boundary diffusion creep requires the diffusion over potentially longer distances. But when atoms migrate or uh, move by diffusion throughout the crystal structures, they have to bypass lots of obstacles, lots of um, perhaps inclusions, perhaps sites of high dislocation density. And therefore, the process is slower than uh, diffusion of cations along the grain surface. For volume diffusion, we need low to intermediate differential stresses and uh, usually higher temperatures compared to grain boundary diffusion creep. Let's talk about dissolution creep, which uh, also is known as pressure solution or dissolution precipitation creep. The terms already suggest that there is a fluid present, uh, something into which you can dissolve ions from crystal surfaces. And that is uh, very different from what we have seen in uh, volume diffusion or in grain boundary diffusion creep, which potentially or normally are dry processes. The dissolved cations from crystal surfaces might be uh, precipitated nearby, for instance, in strange shadow shadows of crystals um, in, in the matrix. Uh, but they also could go fairly far and then form hydrothermal veins or layer parallel lenses meters or hundreds of meters away from the site where dissolution had occurred originally. We have again a similar situation like in grain boundary diffusion creep. We have a, a set of crystals. Uh, there might be pore space in between and in the pore space and along grain boundaries you might find a hydrothermal fluid. If you expose such an environment to differential stress, that means to a stress vector sigma 1 that is different from another stress vector sigma 3, you will produce stress concentrations along the interfaces. They are here highlighted in black. Here, dissolution occurs and material will move into solution, into the fluid phase. This fluid phase might get extracted and uh, then will be enriched in cations and from these saturated or oversaturated fluids, uh, minerals might precipitate in other places, for instance, in hydrothermal veins. This is a very important process that not only changes the shape of rocks, it also might dissolve uh, precious metals, for instance, and uh, redistribute and concentrate these precious metals in specific sites, hydrothermal veins, or also layer parallel lenses within a rock. And that is very important for mineral exploration and economic geology. We see here the process uh, in an advanced stage. We see the pore space has been closed by changing shape of minerals, of crystals. We see grains like this grain here or that grain have uh, changed in shape quite a lot by dissolving material and removing it from that volume of rock. And uh, that is important, an important difference to the previously discussed processes. This solution creep, or pressure solution, is non-isochoric. That is a process in which the volume can change. And we see this illustrated here with the reference circle and the strain ellipse. We see clearly the strain ellipse here as the post-kinematic, the post-deformation state. Uh, has a smaller area than the reference circle had before. And these two semicircles here at the bottom, at the top, would represent the amount, the magnitude at which volume has been lost during dissolution creep. We see here a, a different uh, illustration from a different textbook. Uh, again, stress concentration is acting on a certain surface that is wetted by a, uh, by a fluid phase. Into this fluid phase, we dissolve parts of the crystals and parts of the crystal. And this fluid phase might redistribute material into the locations that are at lower stress, which might be nearby, or which might be at any distance away from the locality at which dissolution occurs. The dissolution of different mineral species uh, can reach different magnitudes because uh, it it depends essentially on the mineral phase and uh, how well or how easily it might uh, dissolve. Uh, 
You know, uh, or halite is sodium chloride, that is your normal table salt that you use every day. And you know that salt has a very high solubility in, in, in water, even in hot water. You can dissolve uh, quite a lot of, of salt. If you imagine that you have a fluid phase that is maybe two or 300 degrees hot, halite will dissolve very quickly and very effectively. So halite has a very high solubility. And uh, other minerals like amphibole and pyroxene, for instance, have a very low solubility in typical hydrothermal fluids. Carbonates, and you know that, for instance, from cast features uh, that might form uh, caves, uh, carbonates have also a very high solubility. Acid rain, for instance, easily can dissolve uh, carbonates uh, near the surface at low temperatures. At higher temperatures, the dissolution will be even more effective. Amongst the silicates, uh, quartz has the highest solubility, uh, higher than feldspar or than micas, or as mentioned before, the amphiboles or pyroxenes. And uh, therefore, quartz will be selectively dissolved if you are looking at a rock that has different silicate phases. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, quartz and feldspar or quartz and micas in a certain mixture, in a random distribution. If fluid phase is present and uh, differential stress acts on this rock, then the quartz will be dissolved preferentially. Here we see how that might work in a, in a real rock. We see here in white quartz crystals and interspersed we see in orange another phase that is not easy to dissolve. For instance, white mica um, distributed in uh, some volume proportion. If we expose this rock to differential stress, for instance with a vertical maximum stress vector, we will start to dissolve SiO2 in the hydrous fluid and that SiO2 will come preferentially from quartz. We must not forget that also white mica contains SiO2. SiO2 is just a component. The mineral in this case here would be quartz uh, containing only the component SiO2. So this SiO2 from the quartz, because of its high solubility, will be dissolved into the hydrous fluid and then potentially moved out of this area. This could, for instance, uh, remove 40% of the quartz that originally was present in this rock. And that means volume loss. Here we see how that might look like later. Here we now see that the uh, mica content, the mica amount, has stayed, has remained the same like before. If you would count the crystals here, they are exactly the same number of crystals. But the volume of quartz, the number of quartz crystals or their size, has been reduced. That means proportionally, mica is more abundant in this rock after the solution creep compared to the original rock that has formed by diagenesis, for instance, or by very low-grade metamorphism. In reality, that means that dissolution creep is an effective process to enhance or to form foliations. Schistosity, cleavages, we will talk about that a bit later. But the foliation in a mica schist, for instance, uh, that you very commonly see in the, the field, say, green schist facies terrains, this foliation is most dominantly produced by dissolution creep, by the selective removal of quartz, which relatively concentrates mica, which is not as easy to dissolve. That even works if mica in the initial rock is uh, randomly distributed or has a non-uniform orientation. During the dissolution of quartz, these mica crystals will rotate into a preferred orientation, and here we see how that looks like. Again, we remove about 40%, say 40% of the quartz. We lose volume. And the rotation of mica crystals will again form a, a foliation. And this foliation might be oriented perpendicularly to the maximum principal stress. At least that is one option, how such a foliation could find its orientation. I have written out here a number of uh, important facts about dissolution creep because I uh, really want that to, to sink in. Uh, dissolution creep is very effective and it is possible 
at relatively low temperatures in the sub-green chest fasces and the lower green chest fasces because we do not really have to uh, change the internal structure of crystals. This is different from a volume diffusion or from grain boundary diffusion creep where we by diffusion, by plastic processes, change the shape of crystals. Here we just remove parts of the easy to dissolve crystals. We remove material from high stress sites and dissolve them in a fluid. This is more a chemical process. Uh, of course it also depends on stress, but here uh, a chemical process that can already happen at relatively low temperatures. And I'm talking here about sub-green chest fasces temperatures in carbonate rich rocks even at lower temperatures 100 degrees 80 degrees might be enough to cause dissolution creep in a carbonate rock in a mica rich rock maybe 150 degrees would be sufficient to have a fluid that can take up quite substantial SiO2 from quartz dissolution when we go into the green schist fasces above 300 maybe 400 degrees plastic deformation processes controlled by dislocation slip or dislocation climb by volume diffusion or by grain boundary diffusion creep are faster and become more dominant. But at low temperatures, and that is where most of the foliations form in micaceous rocks, for instance, in quartz-rich micaceous rocks, uh, at low temperatures dissolution creep is very, very important. There's a website uh, that you can check out for dissolution creep or pressure solution uh, where there are lots of examples and uh, further explanation. If you find some time, please visit that website. Let's have a look at the textures that indicate dissolution creep. And uh, sometimes you actually can see that in the field or in thin section. Uh, we see here, for instance, a rhyolite that is a volcanic rock, a volcanic rock in which you uh, very often find euhedral quartz grains. Now we see here quartz grains that still have some euhedral shape. We see here crystal faces over here and here. But here we see a crystal face that normally would have stuck out in this direction that is removed. And at the same time, where we would expect to find a euhedral crystal face, we see the concentration of undissolvable material, in this case most likely white mica and perhaps a little bit of graphite. The same we see over here. The euhedral shape that we see elsewhere in this crystal is here removed, it's uh, dissolved, and uh, we see the concentration of undissolvable material in this area. Here we see an illustration again how that happens. Removal from high stress sites and redistribution of material to lower stress sites. Here we don't really see the uh, growth of, of rims. The material that is dissolved from this euhedral crystal or that euhedral crystal uh, might have gone into solution and might be re-precipitated somewhere else. What we see here is uh, typically observed in carbonate rocks uh, these are things that look like fever curves here and uh, zigzagging little surfaces that typically contain dark material. This is undissolvable material in a carbonate rock that is also present here in these areas but is not as concentrated. Here along these so-called stylolites we find the concentration usually of graphite in marble and uh, this concentration of graphite in marble comes from the removal of carbonate. That means again here we have a mixture of carbonate and graphite along the stylolite surface and this is typically such a zigzagging surface we find less carbonate and more of the material that could not be dissolved. Here we see examples from uh, other rocks, uh, pyrite bearing rock or here a garnet bearing rock and we see here a strong foliation, a foliation in which mica is, uh, is concentrated and we see here in the strain shadows on the sides of this hard garnet crystal the precipitation of quartz. This quartz obviously got not dissolved from the garnet because uh, the garnet is a, a mineral phase with very um, 
poor solubility. But what we see here is precipitation from a fluid phase of SiO2 that got dissolved somewhere else, probably from the source mineral quartz. So here we see beautiful fibrous wings of quartz that have precipitated in a very low-grade metamorphic rock around a spherical sulfide mineral. Sulfide uh, probably did not get very much dissolved, but here in the strange shadows we see these beautiful fibrous quartz crystals. The most common evidence of dissolution creep in quartzitic or metapilitic rocks are quartz veins. We see here uh, how they look like and you will find them all around Grahamstown. All around Grahamstown you find Wittenberg quartzites, you also find shales and these rocks have experienced some deformation and metamorphism at low grade in the green schist facies. This is good environment for dissolution creep and uh, this formed these quartz veins that we see here or in more sophisticated form here, these, uh, in these tension gashes. All this quartz got precipitated from hydrothermal fluids that have cracked open the, the rock and formed these quartz veins. Uh, that is something that you can see not only in the field around Grahamstown, you also will find it in pavement stones that are made from these quartzites, these Wittenberg quartzites. Uh, that, uh, that come from nearby. So when you walk over campus, keep your eyes peeled. You definitely will find examples of such quartz veins. And then you should think about hydrothermal processes, about precipitation of SiO2 in the form of quartz in such veins. And somewhere this SiO2 must come from. In our area here, this SiO2 most likely got dissolved by dissolution creep. Here, fibrous veins that you also might find here in this area. And here, microscopic views where you again see a very sophisticated surface of what we call a crenulation cleavage, where the undissolvable micaceous material got concentrated and uh, quartz got dissolved. We see here a close up. Uh, this initially was a rock with a fairly uniform distribution of mica and quartz. Much of the quartz has been removed and that led to the concentration of uh, mica along these surfaces and at a later stage these surfaces got folded. This is a crenulation cleavage. We will talk about that in uh, later this course or uh, probably in more detail in the third year course. Let's have a look at strain maps. We now have talked about a number of deformation processes. Let's place them relative to each other in terms of the temperature at which they normally form and the differential stress that is required to form them. If we have a very low temperature and we increase the differential stress uh, to fairly high levels until a rock gives in, we might form fractures. We might form a fault and we might form fractures and fragments which then would indicate cataclysms as a dominant deformation process. If the differential stress doesn't increase to a level where fracturing is possible, we might form mechanical twins, which we haven't covered, or dissolution creep. But dissolution creep is only possible, as you know, if a fluid phase is present into which we can dissolve cations. With increasing temperature, we come into the field of grain boundary diffusion creep. We have learned grain boundary diffusion creep is possible at slightly lower temperatures compared to volume diffusion, where cations move through the internal parts of crystals. And uh, so here we see it's a temperature controlled process. Differential stress values or magnitudes can be quite variable for either grain boundary diffusion creep or volume diffusion creep. At high differential stresses, uh, the deformation uh, is, is accommodated only by dislocation creep because diffusion processes are not fast enough to respond quickly enough to the high differential stress. So dislocation creep is usually a high differential stress uh, mechanism uh, taking place at quite variable temperatures starting from fairly low temperatures going into the high temperature field. We see here some strain maps that are quantified for quartz and for calcite. Uh, 
uh, we see here temperatures listed and we see here these curves which refer to strain rates starting uh, at low strain rates at very slow deformation at already fairly moderate temperatures and moderate differential stresses but when the uh, strain rate increases becomes faster a dissolution creeper requires higher temperatures and higher stresses we also see here dislocation glide which is also called uh, dislocation slip uh, we see taking place at high differential stresses and highly variable uh, temperatures depending on how fast that has to take place uh, at, at uh, very high strain rates or very uh, or slightly lower strain rates this location glide needs different minimum conditions in terms of stress and temperature here is this location creep again with the set of uh, conditions for different strain rates and here volume diffusion creep is taking place uh, at low strain rates and relatively high temperatures. I wouldn't take these temperatures here too seriously because also it depends on uh, a number of other factors which are not plotted here. But in principle you see here low strain rates promote dissolution creep at already uh, relatively low temperatures and low differential stresses. If you want to do the deformation faster and faster you go into uh, different processes of, of deformation and you require different temperatures for them to take place. Here's an, another example for calcite. I'm not going to uh, describe that in much detail, but here in principle you see the same kind of um, distribution of deformation processes depending on stress or temperature. And that is in principle what you should know. You should know that the uh, deformation process that is dominant in a specific rock depends on the differential stress or the temperature. Important in that regard is that uh, at conditions that might allow volume diffusion creep, dissolution creep remains possible provided that there is a fluid phase present and uh, also in this realm grain boundary diffusion creep might take place. That means at high temperatures and uh, moderate to higher differential stresses several deformation processes might occur concurrently in the rock. So when we think about plastic deformation, uh, we have learned that in many processes of plastic deformation, chemical bonds within the crystals are continuously rearranged. And this can happen by dislocation slip or by dislocation creep, uh, leading to volume diffusion or to grain boundary diffusion creep. And what we see is that um, the shape of a crystal can change without actually breaking the rock. This is illustrated here by a yeah, very kind of Mickey Mouse example. If you have a, a lump of dough and you load it with a certain uh, force, it will change shape. But what if our lump of dough is now deep frozen? Obviously, it will take a much larger load before it changes shape. And if it eventually changes shape, it might do so by fracturing, by breaking. And although this is not a quite accurate example for rocks, we will learn that the factor temperature can substantially change the behavior of rocks during deformation. Thank you very much so far. Uh, we are going to start now with a new section, and uh, this is recorded in another file. Thank you very much.